Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to class four of Edible Education 101, spring 2019, a rainy, cold, damp night here at the University of California at Berkeley. I feel a little drenched. We're, we're experiencing what's called an atmospheric river right now. This is uh, one of these new climate-related events where we pick up this stream of air and storms and water from Hawaii. I think we've gotten almost three inches of rain in one day, which is very unusual for California. Thanks for coming out on a rainy night. This is a photograph I took just two days ago of the first cherry blossom that I saw in the orchard. And I, I did promise you that I would bring the Buddha's hand from the tree that you saw last week. So if you'd like um, an invigorating whiff of this after class, please take a hit. So tonight we have a really great and important class. This is the first time we've actually focused on the Farm Bill in Edible Education since I've been leading the class. And um, we were lucky enough last week and the week before to have Marion Nessel here as a guest in the class. And you got to read one of her articles this week about how the Farm Bill drove her insane. And we're just delighted to have three very special guests who each bring a very unique perspective to this topic. And I'm going to be um, having Nina Ichikawa introduce everyone, but I'll bring her up in just a few minutes. But you know, before we get started, I wanted to remind you about this, um, this cycle that we've been talking about. As you know, the theme this year is all about taking action. And uh, we talked about this cycle of sort of following our curiosity and our passion, immersing ourselves with attention and energy and learning as quickly as we can, reflecting on what we're learning, and then integrating that learning, and then developing plans for action. I was thinking about this week how important signals are to entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are always looking for indicators and patterns, and they employ something I like to call tracking. You know, and I've been turning on my own tracking mechanism here um, trying to respond to your interests. A lot of interest in this class this year has been bubbling up around access for healthy, nutritious, planetary friendly food so that it's not just something that is afforded people with a means but really a human right. So I saw today in the news an interesting story that Blue Cross, which is one of the largest insu uh, health insurance plans in the country, just launched a food delivery uh, program, kind of like Blue Apron, but they're making it available, I think, in 15 to 25 of the most underserved zip codes in Chicago. They're trying a, a six-month pilot, and they've created something called Food Q, and it has an interface and an app just like Blue Apron or Postmates or Munchery or any of those food delivery services, but it has a different um, customer in mind. And the founder of this program said, we know that zip code is as important as genetic code in determining a person's health. And Blue Cross Blue Shield, for those of you in the public health program, know a lot about the social determinants of health. So where you live, if you live without any access to healthy food, you're not going to um, have a healthy diet to begin with. So I was, I was fascinated with this. So they're going to 25 underserved zip codes, $10 monthly fee, which would include free delivery, and two meals for $10. And they have a plan where you can actually donate the second meal to someone else. So this is fascinating. And the other thing that's interesting from an entrepreneurial perspective or from an innovation perspective is that this program was put together through partnerships. So you've got the um, person with the unmet need is not, the, the beneficiary isn't necessarily the person with the means to pay the full price of the meal, but the health insurer really has the long-term costs that they're bearing. So Blue Cross Blue Shield and they have an innovation group 
they're effectively subsidizing this. And the other thing I thought was interesting was it's not just for Blue Cross Blue Shield members. They, they're doing it on a community-wide basis. So this will be something for us to track and follow, a great experiment of kind of translating something that was initially introduced to you know, mostly affluent communities um, now into uh, underserved communities. And really interesting to use the purveyors of the, um, you know, the people who are already preparing the food, and then they've looped in uh, delivery, uh, messenger services. So they're engaging also uh, a whole community of people to make this happen. Uh, another thing on, on my radar, uh, you know, last week I talked to you about this crazy Super Bowl ad for the Devour food porn and their amazing list of ingredients. Well, Leslie Aiken, a student in our class here and now our student representative, brought to my attention one of her favorite Super Bowl ads. Did anyone see this Bud Light commercial that criticized Coors Light and Miller Light for using corn syrup in their beer? Anybody see that? This is this I, I this is worth watching. I won't I won't um, entertain you with it here. But this was a fascinating uh, commercial and strategy by Bud Light to basically um, try to differentiate their product against two of their competitors, making a big deal that they don't use corn syrup, and um, that provoked a tweet from the National Corn Board saying, America's corn farmers are disappointed in you, Bud Light. Our office is right down the road. We would love to discuss with you the many benefits of corn. Thanks, Miller Light and Coors Light for supporting our industry. So as Marion Nessel always reminds us, everything about food is political. I thought this would be a good tie-in to talk about the farm bill today because so much of the farm bill goes to support growing the corn, which creates the corn syrup. Now, if you go to this tweet and read all the comments, it's just fascinating because some people are arguing, well, any kind of beer needs some kind of sugar to ferment, you know, to create the alcohol. It doesn't matter if it's corn syrup or rice syrup. So that was one argument. Another argument was, well, corn syrup is not high fructose corn syrup. There's a difference there, and Bud Light doesn't use that either, and neither do Miller Light or Coors Light. But you know, the more I was reading all these arguments, I thought it's kind of crazy to think about like trying to differentiate beer that it's healthier <laughs> than another kind of beer. But to me, this just started to make me think about all the things that Urvashi told us about how First of all, how opaque this is, how confusing these issues are. Um, and apparently, the people that own Bud Light spent close to $20 million in advertising at the Super Bowl to promote alcoholic beverages. Now they're trying to position Bud Light to be healthier than its competitors. So, uh, you know, a great irony this week. So I'm going to leave um, the remainder of the time for our three uh, guests today. I'm really delighted to introduce you to Nina Ichikawa, who's a really dedicated and beloved uh, lecturer here at UC Berkeley and is the acting director of the Berkeley Food Institute. She's brought a great sense of um, what's important here for us to focus on. I know some of you in the public policy school have taken her Farm Bill class. I was looking on the internet yesterday and just, you know, for something as big as the Farm Bill that we've all read about now, it's interesting because I think only about four or five universities in the country, even the ag schools, have a course in the Farm Bill. So we're very lucky here at Berkeley to be concentrating on this, and we're really lucky to have Chrissy and Shanti uh, joining Nina uh, on the program tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to have a warm welcome for Nina Ichikawa. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm beyond excited that we're gonna be spending the next hour talking about the Farm Bill. Anyone that knows me knows that this is an area of passion of mine, and um, it's really my background that informs my passion, and I'll just give you a real quick nutshell is that 
I come from a family farming background here in Northern California, and I got into political organizing around the time of the Iraq War. I went on to serve in uh, President Obama's uh, United States Department of Agriculture and also for a, uh, the senator from Hawaii. And the Farm Bill was sort of an opportunity to marry all my passions for citizen engagement and also improving the food system. So ever since I heard about it, how I understood how opaque it is, uh, I became very excited about demystifying it and sharing it because I think it's a very important tool for us to improve our food system. So I, I actually, that's why I assigned the Farm Bill Drove Me Insane or <laughs> share that reading with you all because I, th I just want to step back and share a caveat that uh, studying the Farm Bill can be a lifelong experience. <laughs> I hope that tonight is the beginning of that adventure, but I want to just pre-release you from any worry that you are going to have a full grasp of it at the course at the end of tonight or even at the end of a decade. Um, we just want to really give you a beginning introduction, highlight, and excitement uh, so that you can study further and continue to activate your neighbors, friends, and others about this. So um, to that end, I invited two experts who I think will be great to help us on this journey. Um, they are Shanti Prasad from Alameda County Food, Community Food Bank. Uh, here um, in the region, and she'll be talking more about um, the nutrition title, the largest title of the Farm Bill. And Christina Badaraco, who's recently one of your colleagues, um, a recent grad of our School of Public Health, who went on to co-author the newest edition of a very important Farm Bill primer um, with an author named Dan Imhoff. So um, she's now looking nationally at both the Farm Bill and Farm Bill education. So. Without further ado, I will just let you know, we decided that we would try to break this down into a top 10 list. Actually, it's 11 because you get a freebie. And um, I'll, let, I'll let Christina go ahead now and, and let you know how we're going to do it and uh, what's in store for tonight. Thank you so much. will be breaking down over the next hour or so and I'm going to offer a, um, oops, a brief little introduction. I know some of you have taken a class about the Farm Bill and you certainly had a few opportunities to read some great articles to orient yourselves but I'll just offer a few introductory points before we dive into some of our uh, take-home points and calls to action over the rest of the evening. God bless you. So the Farm Bill is our largest piece of agricultural legislation in the U.S. And the, it has 12 titles or sort of categories which are listed on the right side of this slide here. Uh, the top four commodities, um, I'm sorry, there, so it doesn't quite go in order there, but four titles in particular, commodities, conservation, nutrition, and crop insurance receive the largest amount of funding through the Farm Bill. Uh, if you envision the entire Farm Bill, which the most, the most recent one is projected to cost about $900 billion over its lifetime, if you envision that in a $1 bill, the graphic you see on the left side of the screen here shows about how much of that funding goes toward each title. And so you'll see by far the biggest title is nutrition. And again, Shanti's going to talk with you a lot more about what goes into that. Um, and then the next three largest, crop insurance, conservation, and commodity subsidies. Um, that leaves less than 1% of the rest of the funding that goes toward the other eight titles. And that includes uh, all the funding for agricultural research, funding toward um, horticulture, uh, what the Farm Bill considers specialty crops, or the fruits, vegetables, nuts, and other types of things um, that uh, we, we want people to be eating more of. Um, so the Farm Bill is passed roughly every five years in the U.S. So President Trump signed the most recent Farm Bill into law at the very end of December. And uh, this was an update to the most recent one from 2014. Uh, it came out of a season of very intense debates. Most of what we heard about in the news had to do with work restrictions and the SNAP program, uh, add, adding uh, work restrictions and eligibility restrictions. There were a few additional debates about forestry and pesticides. Um, again, SNAP, I'd say, was, was the most prominent there. Um, and so I think over, over the next hour or so, we'll be talking more about how 
you all as taxpayers, you all as citizens, and you all as eaters should be really concerned about and interested in uh, making some changes in what, what goes into a lot of these titles that you see here. So I think I'll hand it over to Shanti now. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shanti, and uh, I work at Alameda County Community Food Bank. Um, I have been there for about four years and have been doing state and federal anti-hunger and anti-poverty policy uh, there. Before that, um, I was in New York City uh, doing um, organizing and advocacy work uh, and, uh, and got my start by getting a master's in food systems at NYU. Um, but I am a California native, grew up in the Central Valley. My grandparents were farm workers uh, and have always had an interest in food, where it comes from, and how um, our culture is uh, surrounded by, how our cultures are developed through our food um, uh, activities. So I'm going to move on. Oh, and so this is just a bit of what we do at Alameda County Community Food Bank, obviously on the left hand side there, we just we put out a lot of food. We serve one in five people in Alameda County. There's about a million and a half people in the county. Um, but we do so much more than that that people don't know about. And that includes the policy advocacy work that I talked about. Um, and we're, we're going more and more into understanding poverty and the racial and economic barriers that uh, are root causes of poverty. We also have nutrition programs. We have a whole team that is multilingual that helps people uh, enroll in SNAP, which is called CalFresh in California. Um, we have uh, nutrition programs, child and student wellness programs. Um, so we do, we do a whole lot more than, than distribute millions of pounds of food. We know that's not going to end hunger. So moving on. So the nutrition title uh, takes up 80% of the budget in the Farm Bill. Why? Uh, mainly, it's because of the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition uh, Assistance Program. And uh, that out of that 80%, it's about 85% of that 80% of all of the uh, uh, programs in the nutrition title. Um, and so it's, as I said, it's, it's called CalFresh in California because California always has to have a special name for everything. Um, and it used to, and it's, it used to be known as food stamps because there used to be actual, um, like, play money food stamps that were given out to folks to buy food in stores. Now it's an EBT card um, that's given out, and currently there are about 40 million people in the United States. It's a little bit less than that as as the economic recovery has gotten a little bit better. Um, but there's about 40, a little less than 40 million people on it in the program. And it's almost, the program's almost four times larger than any other nutrition program that we have. So school meals, um, the WIC program for women and infants and children, um, SNAP is larger than all of those. And it's designed to uh, expand and retract based on our economy, which is why right now, um, it, it has ballooned up to the amount that it is, and you can see here on the graph on the left that um, it was about uh, just under 30 million, around 26 million um, was the cost of it uh, in 06, 07, and then as the recession hit in 2007 through 11, and there was a much more difficult uh, recovery, um, it increased all the way up to almost 50 million. Uh, people that were on the program, and now it's beginning to fall. Um, so that's why it's such a big program. It's a, called an entitlement program, which means that it, it expands and retracts with, with uh, the economy. So the amount you receive depends on your gross and net income and the number of people in your household, and the income limits are really low. Um, you have to be at about federal poverty level, which is about $1,000 a month if you're one person. Um, and $2,000 a month if you're a family of four. So imagine living on that in uh, the Bay Area um, or anywhere um, uh, in, the, in the country. 
Uh, I think I mentioned the, the average benefit is about $136 a month per person. Um, that's certainly not enough to eat a healthy diet, let alone thinking about organic foods or sustainably produced food. Um, and so though the economy has recovered and the unemployment rate has increased, it's left a lot of workers behind. Uh, wages are very low, many new jobs are unpredictable. You, you might get a job that, that might ha have 20 hours a week at some point and then it drops down. Um, uh, job, although our employment rate has decreased, the, the types, the quality of jobs that we have ha ha is not great. Um, also, another reason that the SNAP program is so large uh, here on the right is a, a program called TANF, or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. It's a cash assistance program um, for families who are in deep poverty. And in the 90s, uh, it was part of, quote unquote, welfare reform, where it was block granted, which means that um, states were giving, given a finite amount of funds to, to run the program however they see fit, and that meant that they could direct funds that go directly to families or they could go to administrative costs. Um, and the result has been that the restructuring of this program has led to a wide variations in how states run the program. And that means that a lot more people, the, the program has essentially disappeared uh, in, in a lot of states, meaning that folks uh, have to rely more and more on SNAP and um, SNAP has really essentially become, for some states, the only safety net program that people have. In California, we're a little bit luckier. Uh, people who are uh, on this TANF program live at 35% of the federal poverty level. Um, and the state, last year, we fought for the state to kick in more funds to supplement that so that families with children are um, living at 50%. 50% of the federal poverty level while also relying on SNAP benefits for food. Um, the nutrition title also includes several other programs that I don't really have the time to go into today, but some of, some of them are for food banks, um, other programs that, ha that help seniors, um, children, um, that help uh, expand food hubs and farmers markets. Um, and one that I want to point out is um, uh, called a Finney Grant. Uh, it was just changed. The name was just changed in this last uh, farm bill, though. It was the Food Insecurity Incentive Program, and now it's the Nutrition Incentive Program. There are lots of acronyms you'll notice as you are studying uh, food policy, <laughs> or any policy, I guess. Um, so this program is really great because it incentiv incentivizes purchasing fruits and vegetables. And here in California, we have what is called the Market Match Program. Um, and you can take your uh, EBT card with your uh, benefits, and uh, if you spend $10 at a farmer's market, you can get an additional $10 to spend. And um, although it, you can, there's only that limit at one per, one uh, purchase, you can, there's no limit to how many times you go to a, a farmer's market and take advantage of that. Um, so I think that's a, it's a great program. It, in, it also helps California farmers, and I think there, there should be a lot more investments made uh, in this program to expand it. California also helps uh, uh, part of this program as well to expand. Um, but on the federal level, more investments should be made for that program. Uh, OK. So I wanted to talk a little bit about and uh, uh, show you some data about what's going on in California. Um, there's, a, as I mentioned, a little bit less than 40 million people now in the United States on CalFresh. There's a little bit less than 4 million people. These, this, this is 2017 uh, data, but the uh, new numbers show that um, people are coming off of the program as their incomes increase. So there's a little bit less than 4 million people in California, so about 10% of Californians are on the program. Uh, if you, uh, about 84% of them are children or seniors um, or people uh, who are taking care of children. Um, and most recipients who can work do work. Um, as I mentioned though, wages are very low. Um, and, and 
down here is a snapshot of the types of jobs that people have who are accessing SNAP benefits. You'll notice at the, the top there, the most um, are cooks and home health workers. And then second from the top are ag workers. So there, there's quite a few people in the food industry who are working for extremely low wages. Um, in, the, in the Greater Bay Area, there's a, almost 400,000 people who are on SNAP benefits. And in Alameda County, that number is at, at about 100,000 um, people. And then since you are all students, I wanted to talk a little bit about college student hunger. There was a new report that just came out, uh, a, a GAO study, that estimated that there were about 30% of students are uh, struggling to, um, have to get food, um, who are food insecure. Food insecure basically means that you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Um, there, you have reduced food intake or reduced food quality sometime throughout the year. Um, and in 2016, uh, UC Global Initiative did a study on uh, students throughout the UC system. Um, and I just want to give you a little pop quiz and find out uh, what you think they found for what food insecurity is for undergraduates. So um, raise, your hand, there, raise your hand if you think, there's three options. If you think that 25% um, of students are food insecure, 33%, or almost 50%. So 33, 25%, 33%, almost 50%. It's almost 50%, 48% of undergrads uh, reported that they, they are food insecure. So since that study, um, state laws have, have changed to expand student eligibility in SNAP. Um, there have been more food pantries um, throughout uh, the college uh, system. Um, our food bank has, has uh, developed a partnership with Cal specifically, um, and has and SNAP enrollment has gone from 26 new students in 2015 to 559 in the last academic year, and this year we plan to enroll about 1,000 new students into the program. And I have a flyer here if anyone is interested in learning more or thinks they might qualify for SNAP. So who deserves to eat? Um, although the Farm Bill was just passed, uh, and as Chrissy mentioned, um, there were highly contested cuts to SNAP, work requirements uh, um, that were defeated, um, that were rejected by you know, bipartisan Congress. Uh, the Trump administration is now attempting to bypass the Farm Bill um, through an executive action to impose oppressive time limits uh, on the program. There, the, and before I go into kind of like the nitty gritty of what that threat is um, and why you should um, speak out about it, um, I wanna address like these constant threats to safety net programs um, like SNAP um, and that actually just perpetuate the false narrative that poverty is the fault of the poor. Um, and therefore, they don't deserve uh, to meet their basic needs, like eating. Um, rather, um, poverty is the re result of policies that promote economic, racial, and gender inequities. And I believe that with advocacy and voting and more civic engagement, we can work to, uh, to change these policies for the better. Um, there's, there's a myth about people living high on SNAP, and as I just told you, it's the average that people receive is $136 a month um, per person. And also that it prevents work. And the, da the data shows um, that actually most SNAP recipients who can work do. Um, among, among SNAP households with at least one working age non-disabled adult, more than half work while they are receiving SNAP benefits. Um, and because many workers turn to SNAP when they're between jobs, more than 80% work within the year that they are receiving the benefit at least. Um, and the rates are even higher with families with children. The reality is that many people are working for very low wages 
um, and they have unpredictable and un insufficient work hours from week to week. So back to the current attacks on SNAP. In, uh, in the 90s, during welfare reform, the able-bodied adult without dependence rule was imposed. Um, so, so also referred to as ABODs. Um, and what this means is that if you were between the ages of 18 and 49 years old, uh, and you can be on SNAP benefits for three months uh, out of three years while being unemployed. So you lose your job, you're looking for work, you don't find a job within three months, you're off the program because being hungry is gonna help you find work um, more easily. Um, so even SNAP recipients who state their, their employment and training programs and even SNAP recipients who, who states don't really operate many of these programs because they're underfunded, um, especially in rural areas, doesn't matter if you're trying to look for work, you'll, you, uh, the ABOD work requirement um, means that you will be kicked off the program. However, um, there, are many there are many states that you, where you can, yeah, almost done, where, I, where you can have waivers. And during the recession, um, uh, California and several other states were able to apply for waivers. Um, and now that California's unemployment rate is at 4%, um, we have lost our state waiver, but we, out of our 58 counties, we're still, at, in 55 of those counties, we sh are still able to have the waiver um, because of our, the unemployment rate. So in this current uh, proposed executive action that the Farm Bill rejected, um, it would severely limit the state waiver option by increasing the rate at which unemployment must be to qualify for the waiver. Um, and this map just shows that right now, it, those who are the, the counties that are in pink, all of those folks have the waiver on this ABOD rule. And if this rule were to be become, proposed rule were to become law, that would just flip. And 55 counties would have to imp now impose this three month time limit. Um, so also, you know, Unemployment rates across a state or a region often don't accurately reflect um, the higher unemployment rates among people who may not have a high school diploma or a college degree, um, or people of color uh, disproportionately have higher unemployment rates um, than white people. And so this rule would disproportionately affect those people. I also want to point out just like how crazy it is that there's this name ABOD, able-bodied adult without dependent, to single out a category of people who are struggling to um, to meet their basic needs, um, and it, it really just dehumanizes people and discredits the truly harrowing experiences that some of them have. For instance, there are uh, this graph here. Is you'll notice that there are 46% of people are between the ages of 18 and 29 years old. Uh, and there are uh, many people in that, in that um, population who are former foster youth who at age 18 are kicked off the program um, and are just you know, trying to be employed, get their, life back, get their lives together. Um, there's also uh, a lot of cases of domestic abuse um, where you know people are struggling with all kinds of other things in their lives, um, and I think it's just incredibly cruel and harsh to impose a three-month time limit um, on them. Um, there's also in that it's called an able-bodied adult, so that means that you have not been declared legally disabled, but there are also lots of other um, ailments that you that people have that are you know may not be um, deemed. Dis, that you uh, have a disability, or you just haven't been able to, you know, make it to the doctor to be able to present your case that you are legally disabled, or you're caring for another family member. So there's just there's just lots of other um, um, 
instances of what is really going on when you look at uh, people's lives on a case-to-case -case basis rather than kind of perpetuating this idea of this able-bodied adult who doesn't, who's lazy and poor and doesn't want to work. Um, so, taking essential benefits like food away from them is, is really just, is not going to help pe pe put people back to work. So, um, there is a, if you go to frac.org, you can speak out against this rule. Um, there are an estimated 755,000 people in the United States who would be affected by, by this rule. Um, and it would be, and I even got these little papers here that you can learn more about it. Um, and uh, we have until April 2nd to, to uh, make a public comment. Seems to be how um, the Trump administration is doing laws these days. We've been doing, making public comments left and right about a variety of things that I don't have time to go into. But so that is uh, the nutrition title for you in a nutshell. And I will now pass it on to Chrissy. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Chrissy. Uh, to share just briefly a little about myself, I am here today visiting from Washington, D.C. I'm an alumna from the School of Public Health from 2017. Uh, over the past year, I was at Massachusetts General Hospital doing my di uh, dietetic internship, and I recently published a book about the Farm Bill, so that's primarily what brings me here to talk with you all today. Uh, I've also had a couple other wonderful job opportunities recently where I've been working with the Transamerica Center for Health Studies on a healthy cookbook project, and then also the Lexicon of Sustainability um, on a, a project looking at the food as medicine movement. So uh, the first point that I would like to talk about is the, the crisis we have in the US right now where we have an aging population of farmers, and we don't have enough beginning farmers moving in to fill the void to produce food for uh, to produce food for our food system. So if you look in the figure on the top left, that's one of the figures from the book that I just published, um, you'll see the gray line on top shows over the last roughly half century, the increase in average farm size in the US has occurred at the same time as we've had a drastic decline in the number of farms. So as farms have gotten bigger and bigger, we have fewer and fewer farms. So that's the process of consolidation. Uh, and as, uh, as a result of that, and, and due to other reasons as well, such as migration of young Americans into cities, um, we have a shortage of people going into the field of farming and becoming farmers. So the figure on the top right, another one from my book, shows county by county in the US uh, where we have a deficit of young farmers. Yes, um, a deficit of young farmers. So the uh, white and the lightest gray show parts of the country where less than a quarter of the farmers are what are considered beginning farmers. Now the Farm Bill considers that, that term, beginning farmer, to mean somebody who's been working in that industry for less than 10 years. Um, so starting, I believe, with the, the last Farm Bill in 2014, uh, there was a new program called the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program, which emerged out of an effort to try to fill this void in uh, beginning farmers in the US. And that has allowed for emergence of a lot of really neat programs that are trying to uh, empower and teach um, people of a variety of ages, a variety of backgrounds, how to farm. And uh, in working on my book, I had the pleasure of going down to Salinas and interviewing both uh, the founders of an organization called ALBA uh, and also an alumnus from that program. And I got to do a tour of uh, the, this incubator program and then a tour of uh, some of the farms that had, had formed as a result of that. Um, this organization, in particular ALBA, that received funding through the Farm Bill to empower new emerging farmers in the state of California, um, teaches them organic farming practices. And this individual I have a photograph of here, Javier Zamora, 
um, is that one I got to interview. He started an organic farm. He was an immigrant from Mexico himself and not a farmer really when he moved to the US. He became interested in agriculture. He went back to school for it, became really concerned about what he was learning about food production uh, in the state of California. And so he became interested in organics and he learned about ALBA and so he joined their program um, at this point, he has his own organic farm. He grows organic strawberries, a lot of different crops and flowers. Uh, his, he employs more than 25 farmers uh, with a healthy living wage. He makes a million dollars a year not, that, you know, um, from his, uh, his operations in the U.S. And I just saw he received an award from the Organic Trade Association in the fall. Um, so he's just one of many uh, hard-working American citizens who are moving into this field and who are really benefiting from these beginning farmer programs funded by the Farm Bill. Um, thankfully, the 2018 bill that just passed expanded this program even further, renamed it with the acronym FOTO, the Farmer Outreach Training um, Opportunity, maybe the last O, oh. um, and it also provides more funding for disadvantaged and veteran farmers, which is really important as well. So trying to further expand the field and, and bring in Americans of all shapes and sizes um, to move into farming. So another topic I'll talk about is why is pizza so cheap? So um, if you look at this figure on the left-hand side, another figure I pulled from my book, uh, I'm contrasting a few different images of plates. So the one on the top left, my plate, uh, my guess is a lot of you have seen before. So my plate is the prominent visual tool used by USDA and certainly dietitians and nutrition educators around the US to show what a balanced plate, what a balanced diet should look like. Roughly half fruits and vegetables, um, some whole grains, some protein. Um, the one to the right of that is uh, was created originally by an organization called the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And they created this plate that shows out of all of the recipients of subsidies in the farm bill, how, how does that actually translate to the food that we're eating? And so the biggest chunk you'll see there, uh, meat and dairy cumulatively receive about 63% of uh, commodity supports. Then grains, the grains that we actually eat, receive about 20%. And then fruits and vegetables, what are supposed to, again, fill about half of our plate, get 2%. And at this point, those numbers are a little bit outdated. It's less than that. Um, uh, less than 2% go toward fruits and vegetables. Um, so the same, the, the way that we're using crop insurance subsidies and price supports to create and drive a food system in the US is in stark contrast to the way that we, that Americans and, and everybody um, really should be eating. Um, and, and, and so to dig into that a little bit more, um, how are, so based on what I've mentioned so far, how are, how are meat and dairy benefiting from the subsidies in the Farm Bill? So the figure I have on the bottom right here, um, it might be a little blurry for you all out there, but it shows what is actually done with the corn that we grow in the US. So I'll show in a couple slides how corn gets the biggest chunk of commodity subsidies in the US. But most of that corn, we don't even eat. Uh, we eat a little bit, I think a few, a few percentage points, but those blue dots there, almost 40%, it goes toward animal feed. So we feed livestock, derivatives of corn and soy to some extent, that makes the, uh, those animal products, meat and dairy, artificially cheap. So when we have those things on our, on our pizza, for example, we have cheese and other things, um, those are made really, really cheap by the excess corn and soy that are subsidized through the farm bill. Um, I'll just point out on that figure as well, all of those green dots are actually for corn-based ethanol. So about 30% of the corn that is subsidized goes toward uh, corn-based ethanol used in, in transportation. Um, and so we talked about the cheese on top of the pizza, and then um, grains, most of what you see in that grains category there, that 20%, uh, that's going to be wheat to some extent, corn and a few other grains, but that's part of what helps make the crust in your pizza so cheap. So that leaves just a tiny little bit, that 2% going toward the, uh, the sauce on top of your pizza. Um, and so while that might be the most nutritious part, we know in the school lunch program, it's certainly considered a vegetable. Um, it, that's not really the way that we're, we should be encouraging 
what we should be encouraging American diets to look like. Um, so I'll point out briefly here uh, who are the predominant, predominant recipients of the subsidies given, allocated through the Farm Bill. So the figure on the left there uh, comes from my book, shows a list of uh, 10 of the top recipients of commodity supports in the Farm Bill. So corn gets about 30%, almost a third, of commodity supports in the Farm Bill. Just below that, we see wheat, cotton, soy, rice. Um, so, uh, and then, so those few uh, commodity crops typically grown in monocultures, meaning a single crop grown on a very large farm, are getting the majority of our commodity supports. This figure on the right doesn't actually come from my book. I pulled this from the Environmental Working Group. Uh, they have an amazing database that I used extensively to get data for my book. Um, they publish in a very kind of accessible, user-friendly manner information about where all of the Farm Bill subsidy dollars are spent. So you can search by state, you can search by uh, type of commodity, you can e even see the individual farms and kind of conglomerations who are receiving uh, dollar amounts. Thank you. So um, I'll just point out there the figure, the top 10% of commodity payment recipients were paid 77% of commodity payments. So uh, the vast majority of payments are going toward um, the biggest farmers who are already making the most money. Um, and then my last point here, I will address food waste. So I, I think we in America are starting to move in the direction of thinking more about food waste, and there are a lot of companies who are doing really innovative things to reduce waste. Um, it, it is, so the figure I show here on the top left shows across uh, kind of the food supply chain where food is wasted. So uh, about 16% of food is wasted on farm. So that might mean it's not able to be picked before it decays in the fields. Um, about 2% in manufacturers, 40% in consumer-facing businesses, so restaurants, stores, that sort of thing. Um, but then the biggest chunk, 43%, is actually wasted in homes. Um, so I guess I have kind of two messages that I wanted to share in this slide about food waste. So uh, my first point there is to remember, farm bill aside for a minute, we as consumers are actually huge drivers toward food waste in the U.S. So when we think about um, the way we're buying food at the grocery store, the way we're preparing food at home, all of that plays a huge role in the amount of waste that we produce that ends up in landfills. Um, so it's important for us to all be con conscious consumers um, and eaters in trying to tackle that. But I also wanted to point out here what's going on in the Farm Bill to try to reduce food waste. And this Farm Bill that was just passed in 2018 is the first Farm Bill to actually start to address this problem. So this is really great. Um, this report I have on the top right came out in 2017. This is from the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic. And they published some recommendations that have been widely cited um, and hopefully to some extent used as this Farm Bill is being developed about how uh, strategies for reducing food waste might be written into the Farm Bill. Um, and some of those ended up being adopted. So uh, the new Farm Bill included a new position at USDA. So somebody would be hired as a food loss and waste reduction liaison. So somebody to think more strategically about how to address food waste. Um, there will be funding for at least 10 pilot compost and statewide food waste reduction strategy programs. Um, so in, in the coming months, we'll look forward to hearing how those pilot programs go. Um, issues around food donations are also a big reason why it can make it hard to donate food that might otherwise be wasted. And so there were actually uh, components of this Farm Bill that are seeking to help clarify liability protections for people trying to donate more surplus food. Um, and also more funding for farms to be able to research and innovate to reduce some of their on-farm losses. Um, so again, the, these are a few small programs. We have you know, one new role at USDA, um, but this is definitely moving in the right direction, and, and I think this is pretty promising to address the issue of food waste. So 
at this point, I'll turn it over to Nina. Um, I hope we still have you all. And <laughs> as you can see, it's a pretty uh, huge piece of legislation. I often bring to classes the my doorstop, which is actually a copy of the Farm Bill, so you can see how thick it is. Uh, but I really wanted to encourage you to realize that this is just really highlights, and these were the top 10 or 11 points that we felt were most exciting, but I really encourage you to dive into the blogosphere and decide which part of the far Farm Bill you find most exciting. Um, because fact of the matter is, is you are participating in it by paying your taxes. So uh, like any policy issue, it's a constant push and pull between the good and the bad. I hope that the good is going to you know, prevail, um, sort of like an adventure comic. But if we don't participate, the good will not prevail. So I hope that at this point, you're getting a sense of the, the push and pull. And I don't think any of us three can say that the Farm Bill is a victory, nor that it's a failure, but that there has been an iterative push and pull over the years. And I think, you know, to Professor Rosenzweig's early point about how did you put it, sensing the wind or smelling the atmosphere, um, I am sensing that um, change is afoot in the Farm Bill, and that's due to citizen participation, like from yourselves. So before I get into my favorite parts or the interesting points of this Farm Bill, um, I just wanted to uh, let you know about what's going on here at UC Berkeley with regards to the Farm Bill and Farm Bill education. Well, of course, we are recipients of Farm Bill funding as a land-grant public university, so we do have research dollars that I don't have time to talk too much about, but we do. There are Farm Bill monies, swimming, a little bit, swimming around this campus. Um, but also, we uh, at the Berkeley Food Institute um, were really honored to teach the first ever Farm Bill class here on the Berkeley campus last year. We have some of the graduates of that class in this room. Uh, by the way, the, the Berkeley Food Institute um, is about a five-year-old entity here on the Berkeley campus that is bringing together seven schools, including Haas, and many, many faculty and many, many students to look cross-disciplinarily at food, food and agriculture issues. So I encourage you to check out our website, attend our events, and join us uh, in this uh, ongoing uh, journey to understand and participate in the food system. Um, and if you look on this website I've shared, um, it's, it's a wealth of information on the Farm Bill, including uh, policy briefs drafted by graduates of our class, uh, PowerPoints drafted by students in our class that really dove into different issues and helped to navigate the Farm Bill. Um, for example, a group of students did a great presentation on CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, and the Farm Bill. Um, another great student wrote about the exact uh, challenges to SNAP um, that Shanti talked about, and she really tried to lay out these challenges because many of them um, did not succeed in this uh, iteration of the Farm Bill, but we're already seeing them coming up in different parts of either the federal or state government. So um, we think it's very important to uh, stay mindful of uh, those who don't believe that people deserve to eat and understanding what, what those challenges are going to be. So um, please check out our Farm Bill seminar site and use those materials all the way until the next Farm Bill. I think they'll be useful. Um, so let me get into uh, some of my um, top line uh, favorite points about this 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, the one, one of them, which um, Chrissy already touched on a little bit, is local, uh, local food uh, programs and promotion. And she talked about it a little bit. Why does this matter? Um, you know, buying local is something people often talk about as, of course, a feeling of freshness, a feeling of knowing who your farmer is. Um, but there's also a lot of dispute about uh, how far away is local? Does local really matter? Is local fake? You know, there's some of this talk. But I wanted to really underscore why I believe local still matters and why the Farm Bill and um, those people who decide the Farm Bill agreed um, is because of this slide. Um, this is taken from Oxfam America, uh, this graphic, which shows consolidation in the food industry. Um, has anyone, have you all talked in this class or um, dealt with the issue of consolidation in, in any industry? Well, it's going, it's, it's, it's going pretty fast in the food industry, and this, this graphic shows how few companies are in charge of many of our uh, retail food products. We also are, have a very shrinking pool of companies in, in charge of uh, seeds, in charge of banking in our food system, in charge of real estate in our food system. So um, I'd encourage you to think about buying local, not just as a feel-good thing, which matters, not just as a 
food miles thing, which also matters, but also as a um, point of economic sovereignty for local communities. If your local farmer or your local grocery store is still able to capture some of your food dollars, they are able to still survive. And that keeps our food system diverse, diverse in its ownership and a little more decentralized in its ownership. Um, some of the programs that the Farm Bill funded and the pool for local and regional food funding has expanded over the last few years. Um, the food incentive, food and security nutrition incentive program that was mentioned by um, one of you, and thank you for mentioning it. Um, we also have um, a new program called the Local Agriculture Market Program, or LAMP, which combines two previous programs that were supporting farmers markets and also farmers who want to do what's called value-added production, which means they might want to transform a lower uh, price commodity like milk or uh, funny looking strawberries into high end cheese or strawberry jam. So that's called a value added um, production. And we have seen funding increase for those type of programs, which is a, a big victory. And you may be seeing the results of that at your local farmer's market. We also have new funding for what's called urban, indoor, and other emerging agricultural production research, education, and extension initiative. Um, a communications expert did not think of the title of that program, but it is um, an important recognition of uh, the different types of agriculture production that are happening locally and the responsibility of USDA to support um, more diversification in our food system. Something else that I care about and I think needs attention in the Farm Bill is the issue of immigration and labor, of course. Many people ask, uh, does the farm, why does the Farm Bill not cover labor and protection for workers? Now, it's a very good question. It's also a question of jurisdiction. Um, the Farm Bill is, and USDA were established to um, promote and regulate U.S. agricultural crops. And the Department of Labor, which is represented in our state, Cal OSHA, is supposed to ensure fair working conditions for workers. So at least technically that is sort of the division of labor. And I, while our food system has the responsibility to treat all workers fairly, understandably there is a whole other agency that is supposed to be doing that. And hopefully they interact and talk to each other. But um, immigration has been in the news just a little bit lately. And I think what's very important to talk about with regards to immigration is the trade title of the Farm Bill. So um, trade has always been you know, promoted through the Farm Bill. Um, we give, I think it showed from the dollar amount, what was it, $1.3 billion in this last Farm Bill for trade promotion. Uh, many American farmers rely on, almost exclusively on exports to sell, you know, to sell the, the products of their farm. Um, and how does this end up in impacting immigration? Um, this graphic from the US Department of Agriculture via Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, who does a lot of um, important research on trade impacts, um, showed the increase of corn exports to Mexico. Many of, many of them went through NAFTA and through our quote unquote new NAFTA, um, but the original uh, subsidy support came through the Farm Bill. And what we have seen over the course of the last few decades and even longer is, for example, and Mexico is only one example, we have, um, we have encouraged uh, the sale of very low cost corn products to Mexico that in many cases uh, undermined the local food economy and put local um, Mexican corn farmers out of business, which got them out of the farming business and into the factory business or the unemployment business or unfortunately into the migration business, which many of them didn't want to do in the first place, but um, were forced to. And, um, and part of, so you can, you can see, and we can go down the list of other countries um, that have also been impacted by our trade title. And what's interesting about the trade title is you can read about the Food for Peace Act and the Food for Progress Act, which are part of the trade title, and that might give you a sense of how it's framed. Um, their goal, again, as I said, is to build new markets which can displace local producers. They encouraged, the, tra the title encourages the technology transfer from US to developing markets. And let's think about what that means. That means we have decided that the US agricultural system is the absolute number one way of producing food. And through this title, we train people from other countries on how to produce in the American way, 
either here in the US or in their countries. And um, we are exporting both technology um, and ideas um, to uh, both rich and poor countries um, through this title. And there's a lot of rhetoric of peace and friendship and cooperation and exchange of ideas, which really contradicts our immigration policy, which says, don't you dare come. So it's a funny contradiction in that we are say saying to many people, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to sell you our goods. We'd love to buy our, your goods. Why don't you get enthusiastic about all the great stuff we can sell you from the United States, but oh, you, you're so enthusiastic, you want to come? No, thank you. So I think this is a, it's a hard message. And of course, it's not the only place of contradiction in, in our policies. Um, one more topic that I thought you all might be interested in, and I'm very interested in, is the Farm Bill and climate change. So you can see by how fast I'm talking how much information there is in the Farm Bill. So um, excuse me. And next time, we can do a whole semester on it or a whole year on it, which is what it, what it kind of requires. Um, many people ask, well, does the Farm Bill even touch climate change? And actually, it, it has for many years, many decades. The words are in there, amazingly. And um, here's just a few examples if you're interested in pursuing um, this line of study. Um, for example, the Farm Bill funds soil conservation, which can sequester carbon. Thank you. Um, it funds transition to organic, which can have climate change co-benefits. Um, many of the requirements of organic, and we'll get into this later in the Q&A, um, also have been found to sequester carbon and be one of the few uh, mechanisms that we can actually reverse climate change, which is very exciting. Um, at the same time, and again, the, the good, as one, as Farm A described it, the Farm Bill is the good, the bad, and the awful, O-F-F-A-L. So, um, we have a good in there, and we also have the bad, which is um, it also has significant funding for types of agriculture that are really dependent on fossil fuels. So we're going to have to fix that if we want to um, stop climate change. USDA climate hubs were established around 10 years ago, and there's one, at UC, there's one in Davis if you want to go visit, and they are regional areas to help farmers transition to climate change. So. Um, that is an infrastructure that has been established um, to address uh, the very real impacts of climate change, many of which have affected farmers first, um, which is very unfortunate. Of course, it's a weather-dependent industry, so um, climate change is front and center in, in farm country. So my last slide is, is our bonus, which is about what you can do. Um, uh, I hope my co-speakers agree because I feel very passionate that elections matter. <laughs> and this last farm bill is, I shouldn't have given the answer there. I should have tested you on who are this enthusiastic five gentlemen. Um, they are none other than the new California members on the House Agriculture Committee. So an important detail we didn't, did not mention is that the farm bill is voted on by the House and Senate Agricultural Committees. And before November of 2018, um, both of those committees were, of course, led by Republicans because that was the result of the 2016 election. However, um, as Farm Bill discussions were going back and forth and fighting and complicated, uh, the elections happened. Many people worked very hard. Anyone here worked on the uh, 2018 midterms? Anyone here voted in the 2018 midterms? I hope I have more hands up. OK, thank you. Um, and uh, we had, <laughs> there was a big, a big change in the United States, which is that um, the Democratic Party took control of the House of Representatives. And as a result, and I'm not sure if this is the first time ever, not only is there a new party in control of the House of Representatives, but on the House Ag Committee, there are five Californians. It's unfortunate they're all male identified, but here we are. And they are here to answer your questions. I encourage you to contact all of them and tell them what you think about California agriculture or the future of American or world agriculture. Um, but it's a very interesting time. Um, and some would argue that many of the changes in the Farm Bill that were finally signed in December were results of those election results in November. So there was a, a way the discussion was going. And then it turned, in many ways, particularly about SNAP and the nutrition title, it, it made a harsh turn after the results of that election. And um, uh, let's see, three of these 
uh, three of these gentlemen who are brand new to Congress, the other two are returning, and um, many of them have spoken up about their commitment to sustainable agriculture and creation of a, a better food system. So um, that's a result of, of electoral action. So whatever you think about Congress, um, I just encourage you to participate because that will help determine our next farm bill. That's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for ending on a hopeful note, Nina. We should get the names and email addresses of all of those people. We'll send that out. We should be in contact. It was, I'd also love to know what the average age is. Or that, that guy in the lower right, he looked pretty youthful. 32, perfect. Because it strikes me that it, look, it feels like the farm bill is so outdated for what we're dealing with right now, what we know now, that um, having people who are 32 and probably have little kids and their whole life ahead of them is a helpful perspective. So thank you all. A um, couple quick announcements, and then we're going to take attendance. And then when we finish this, you three can sit in the comfy chairs, and we'll come over here and um, get seated. So just wanted to remind all of the students in the class that the prompt for the first uh, essay, which counts significantly toward your glorious grade in this class, has been posted on B courses, and I really encourage you to read it soon. Um, it's a really interesting challenge for you. Uh, what we're asking you to do is to choose one of the topics that you're either reading about or listening about, listening to in class, or, or something else that strikes your fancy and think deeply and, and research and study sort of what is your uh, perspective on it? What's your, your take? Where do you stand in, in relation to it? What's your opinion about it? And then we're gonna ask you to go talk to somebody in your circle. Your could be your extended family, it could be a neighbor. We want you to go talk to somebody that doesn't share your view about that topic or issue and then you're gonna sh sort of share what you've learned and what you think, and then you're gonna elicit a response from that person and hopefully have a conversation. Hopefully learn how to listen empathetically and learn from one another, and then you get the essay as you get to write what happens. So it seemed like this is kind of an important skill set today to be able to discuss confusing issues that sometimes can be contentious that um, at the root of them, we actually probably all share the same value that we should have the opportunity to eat um, healthy, affordable, accessible food. So that's the assignment. It's due on March 6th. The teaching team is really ready and able to help you with any questions if you can't like sort out the topic or, but, you gotta talk to them before March 1st, okay? No last minute week of it being due uh, contact. All of their emails, my email is in the syllabus. Um, we're working on the farm visit, right, Fiona? We're working on a farm visit, so we're gonna organize a farm visit in, in the coming weeks to Green String Farm, which is where Bob Kennard grows fabulous vegetables. We've got a class representative, Leslie Aiken. Thank you, Leslie, for volunteering to, to do this. And in a couple weeks, we will have a midweek check-in. Also, tomorrow night, um, for those of you that are interested in the future of alternative meat, there is a alternative meat lab here at Berkeley in the engineering school, and they're having a gathering tomorrow afternoon at the Sutarja Center. I can't read exactly where that is right now. Soda Hall. HP Auditorium tomorrow afternoon. And now we're gonna take attendance. Maria is here. Take out your cell phone, please, or your other technology. Do we have to switch that, or how does that work? Okay. Has that been this what?
Nope. Yeah, because the projectors got turned off, so they take a while. All right, we're going to give you a we're going to give you a pass on this. We might do it a little bit later, so don't leave. But we're going to go on. I don't want to waste any more time. Okay, so come up here, uh, join us. We'll come back and see. Can you switch us back to our slides, please? Well, you sit in the comfy chairs. I'll sit here. Um, we're really fortunate tonight. Uh, Christina's publisher was kind enough to send us copies of this wonderful tome on the farm bill. And so the students whose uh, questions were chosen tonight are going to get a copy, and Chris, Chrissy's going to autograph it right here in person <laughs> to you when you come down. But you know, it struck me what was what was fascinating about your your presentation, it seemed like well the the why is pizza so cheap question was fascinating to me. Um, and it, it seemed like you know you have the my plate, which the US government, right, the USDA, I would imagine with the help of the FDA or Somebody comes up with my plate, the U.S. government, mm -hmm. and then Harvard did a modified my plate mm -hmm. that was even a little healthier, and then you showed how the money is actually allocated. So I'm thinking to myself, that's such a beautiful, clear, data-driven chart. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm one of those five guys on the House Egg Committee, you just show me that and say, can't you fix this? So, so like, what's in the way of reallocating the money in a way that it matches the government's recommendation for the way we eat? What, what's holding that back? It seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, um, I think that was something in um, Mary Nestle's article that was addressed a little bit. The Farm Bill is not something that we can really envision being kind of overhauled to align with my plate to support an entirely sustainable, equitable farming system overnight. Um, there are, it's a very complicated process that goes into uh, determining, um, I, I guess debating and determining who gets the dollars. There's an enormous amount of money spent on lobbying for mm -hmm. the Farm Bill every year from uh, the Dairy Council, the Farm Bureau, from the industry that is really interested in perpetuating the status quo and making sure that the soy farmers and the corn farmers, um, you know, the Cattlemen's Association want to make sure that their feed stays really cheap. Um, and when we think about the, a lot of the fruit and vegetable producers uh, who get less than 2%, just that tiny little wedge of subsidies, um, they don't have nearly the amount of money and they don't have the manpower to be able to uh, invest in lobbying to be able to really change things. Um, I think we do have some wonderful advocates. It sounds like new advocates in Congress, but also before there were some. Um, in, in writing this book, I talked a little bit with Congressman Shelley Pingree from the state of Maine and some of her staff, and she really helped a lot on the LAMP program that Nina mentioned to promote more funding for um, local and sustainable farm uh, farming through the Farm Bill. Um, so I think there are, there are some people interested in making that more of a priority, but um, I think on, on a larger scale, when we think of all of the people in Congress who are voting, I think there's just not enough determination to change the way the system currently works. Either not enough determination, or maybe, I think to some extent, it might also be a lack of kind of priority and, and awareness. I mean, there are obviously so many other important issues that that people in Congress are voting on. Um, and so I think. And, and siloization. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been talking a lot about that in this class yes. about how um, health isn't necessarily connected to agriculture. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have all of these costs here for healthcare, trillions of dollars really adding up. Mm -hmm. And we're feeding mm -hmm. into that mm -hmm. on this side. Is Grace yeah. Berry here? Where's Grace? Come on down here, Grace. Tell us who you are, what you're studying, and then come get a book after you ask this great question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grace. Uh, I'm a senior studying conservation and resource studies. Um, and my question is, in Marian Nestle's essay, she mentions that SNAP incentivizes the purchase of unhealthy foods 
such as sugar-sweetened beverages, as it eliminates the extra cost of tax from their price. In your opinion, is it appropriate to limit the foods that can be purchased under SNAP in the name of health, or could this, be, could this limitation simply be a form of policing for people's decisions? I bet Shanti, you mm, deal with this yes. question all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been some studies of, of what people on SNAP eat and, and compared to what people who are not on SNAP eat. Um, and it shows that it, it, it doesn't vary a whole lot. They consume the same amount of uh, soda, um, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, uh, people on SNAP do as, as people who aren't. And I, I think, um, although I, I, I think we should find a way to limit soda consumption for everybody, I don't think we should single out um, limiting foods for people who, who are on SNAP. Um, I think we should, we should incentivize Instead, like I mentioned, the, the market match programs, we should, uh, we should incentivize those types of programs to, to get people mm -hmm. to eat healthier. I think it perpetuates the idea like, that I was talking about where people who are poor are lazy or they don't know what to eat. Um, uh, they don't know, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I don't think that's true at all. Um, and to, to limit, uh, if we want to go after the, the, the real root problem, it's, what we were talking about with corn subsidies, what, you know, there's a lot of corn syrup in, in, in sodas. We need to go after the root causes and the, the big ag folks rather than um, poor people who are on SNAP. And just if I could add to that a little bit, just another element of it, I also agree with Shanti, it shouldn't be limited um, for two reasons. One is because it's one of the few remaining uh, public safety net programs, so actually it's replaced uh, support for rent, support for education, other types of support that are going to poor people. So if you consider to have to cover all these means, why would you restrict it more? And another important point, I think, is to compare it to another program of about the same size, which is the mortgage tax deduction for homeowners, which is another federal subsidy that goes directly more to higher income families, more to white families. And would we consider the same restrictions on that federal subsidy to say, you may only buy this type of house, you may only paint it this color. Um, this color is not so attractive, so you cannot paint it with the subsidy. We wouldn't even consider that, and why is it it's, it's so unfair to consider that one subsidy should be more controlled um, for those type of Americans, and another subsidy should be about freedom and upward mobility. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. The, come get this book. Um, the, yeah, that's great. The, and thank you to Island Press for, for donating that. And, and be sure that Chrissy signs it for you later. The, the, the great thing about this book is that it really helps to translate something that is incredibly complicated. And I think in one of the articles we read, it might have been Marion's, um, she was sort of saying it's kind of intentionally written to be complex and difficult to understand in some cases. And you said, Chrissy, that you know, you're, it's, it's just unrealistic to think that it would change overnight because it would disrupt and displace. But at the other hand, it, it feels like one of the things we're kind of calling uh, to action is, is we're kind of running out of time here. And with the urgency of the reports that have come out, we started the class talking about you know, these very recent climate reports saying the models are actually um, underestimating the amount of impact from climate change. And we also talked about early in the class about from Project Drawdown that there's a lot of sort of low-hanging accessible things in food that we can do pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how, you know, we can certainly vote, um, but it seems like we've really got to speed this up um, okay. or else we're going to be on a, a sinking ship, so. Agreed. Um, Emily Musto. Emily, are you here? Uh, come over here to this microphone. While you're making your way down there, I was mm -hmm. going to mention something else. Um, I was reading this magazine called The New Yorker. Have you ever heard of that? Big, yeah. Vaguely. Um, it I'm has, a Californian, oh, that's so. Right, yeah. <laughs> it has this section in it um, called Talk of the Town, which is kind of fun. At the beginning of the magazine, they it's like the New Yorker reporters are kind of like eased eavesdropping in on these conversations that are just happening around town. But the thing I like about it is that they're real uh, signals. They're kind of like trend spotters. Mm. They, they kind of pick up these quirky you know, situations. But 
um, they are always kind of pointing at a trend. You know, may, maybe it's a coastal trend that, that's going to eventually pass into the rest of the country. But this last week, it was really interesting. There was this story of it called Nothing Wasted Trimmings Department. It says, the other day in the kitchen of an event space called Fitzcarraldo in Brooklyn, a visiting chef named Douglas McMaster was putting the final touches on a meal of what he called supernatural peasant food. Oh my God. McMaster is a zero waste chef, meaning that his meals produce no trash. Goes along to talk about his closed loop approach to cooking and how he uses the whole vegetable, not unlike what Dan Barber kind of taught us last year. Um, anyways, this is the dinner was organized by Lauren Singer, a 27 year old founder of the Package Free Shop in Williamsburg. She's best known for fitting six years worth of trash into a single mason jar. You heard of her? So anyway, she'd organized the event she added to spark conversation and community around zero waste in restaurants. So anyway, it goes on and talking about who's there and dropping a lot of names. And then it says, in the dining room, guests chatted over daiquiris, sea bean daiquiris, Douglas fir old fashions. Anyway, Mike Sheffer said that his date, Isabel Carden, a server at the farm to table restaurant Blue Hill, had converted him to the zero waste lifestyle. Just be trash free, he said. If you replace your one-time use items with reusable versions, you can save a lot. And then it says, Juj Echavari, an anesthesiologist, had brought her friend Geetha, a technologist at Bank America. I'm going to get into my situation, but when I run the dishwasher, I put my single-use containers in there. At least they get washed. Anyway, here's the part I wanted you to really hear. It says, they talked about grocery stores. Oh my God, Echavari said, it fills me with anxiety. It's like mounds and mounds of plastic. Cardin nodded. Supermarkets are filled with trash. Supermarkets are filled with, that was, supermarkets are filled with trash. That was the aha. And when you showed that chart that Oxfam put out of all that packaged food, that was like an epiphany, mm -hmm. putting those two things together. I never thought of walking into a, a grocery store that it was filled with trash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now it's mm -hmm. they kind of got a different view. And yeah. I think more and more Americans are thinking that, and that's why Miller Lite, Bud Light had that, new, had that advertisement, which is a tremendous sign of victory for the food movement, that people aren't scratching their head and asking questions. And um, it's made its way to the Super Bowl. So. And it goes yeah. to your point about um, why you should buy local and why you could buy it a farmer's market that's not filled with trash. Or a locally owned grocery store. A locally owned grocery store. Okay, Emily, your turn. Hi, I'm Emily Mesto. I'm from Salinas, California. I'm a sophomore intending to study business. Um, my question for you is, would you agree with Marion Nestle's claim in the farm bill drove me insane that organic production methods aren't nearly an, an alternative way of growing food, or would you agree with the USDA's past claims that organic produce and normal produce do not have major differences? Basically, is it worth the extra money to buy organic? Um, I tend to agree with Mary Nessel more than the USDA, even <laughs> though they, I pay my tax dollars to the latter. Um, I think that they had to say that um, as a result of old loyalties and you know the fact that there are a lot of different types of farmers in the United States and there was a time when it was controversial to say you support organic. Now organic is a powerhouse, a multi-billion dollar industry and now the USDA can say we like both. Maybe in the future it's going to get to a point where they can say organic is better but we're not at that point yet in terms of uh, mainstream acceptance. Um, but I absolutely agree with her that um, organic has been a hard fought, started in California, a hard fought um, agronomic and policy struggle to get um, more oversight over our food system. And that seal has a lot of lawyers and activists behind it who fight four times a year about what should be allowed in organic production systems. Um, so, as I've heard some people say, who are much more experienced in this than I am, that um, it is the most um, tightly regulated part of the U.S. food system. It's not perfect, but 
I definitely disagree with those that say that it means nothing. Um, I don't. I wish it were more affordable, and I'm part of that movement trying to make it more accessible to everyone. Who can be a purist? I buy organic when I can afford it, and I I, I definitely know that um, it's has less pesticides because that's what um, that's what the law is supposed to do, and many people are fined and put in jail every year for violating it. So um, that's that's my feeling on that it's worth something. Um, yeah, but there are, to Chrissy's earlier point about moneyed interests and lobbying interests, it's very threatening to many uh, in industries in this. Many industries see great market opportunity in organic, including Costco, Walmart, other companies are saying organic is huge. Other companies that sell those products that are not permitted within organic systems, obviously they're very threatened and, and they are continuing to lobby. So. And organic has traditionally been framed around its nutritional benefit and people have argued well is it more nutritious is it better for you but it really the cost of growing the food is not reflecting the true cost yeah. right because we're looking at it as being expensive in the short term but if we were to have a 50 year view we would see how expensive it actually is to eat mm -hmm. maybe conventionally right now if we had to pay it in the Form of our portion of the healthcare costs, say, or exactly, and, and that's also in, in our the tax dollars we're paying for those subsidies, mm -hmm. and then our the environmental costs as well. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's just such a silly metric to say nutritionally superior. That's like asking, is a shoe good to eat? You know, a shoe is not intended for eating, and organic was not established to say it is for greater nutrition. So it's, it's really disingenuous to criticize it. There haven't been enough studies, you know, on the nutritional benefits. Organic was established to reduce pesticides um, for the consumer, for the farm worker, and for the communities that surround uh, farming communities. So that is what it's intended is to reduce toxic pesticides in our environment and in our food system. Um, nutritional benefits in terms of like how much vitamins are in something, that's a whole nother question. And, and it's, it's a sort of asking the wrong question of organic, in my opinion. I think, I, to add to that, I think the studies are pretty mixed at this point when we look at nutrition benefit from organics. I think um, maybe especially looking at dairy products, I think they tend to err on the side of saying organics have um, kind of healthier fat profiles and, and um, some of those things. But over, overall, I don't think there really is a whole lot of evidence in terms of kind of immediate macro or micronutrient benefits, but definitely, as Nina pointed out, the studies about pesticides and um, antibiotics. And when we think about soil health, I watched the lecture from Dr. Miller a couple weeks ago talking about the importance of you know, facilitating a healthy uh, bacterial populations in the soil. It absolutely matters for, for that. Um, and, and farmer, uh, farmer health and welfare, there's a lot of research going on here. I know at UC Berkeley School of Public Health and elsewhere looking at the problems across generations that result from farmers' exposure to pesticides um, and from consumers' exposure to pesticides too, so that definitely matters. Dr. Julie Guthman's gonna be here in a couple of weeks talking oh, about her research mm -hmm. in that field. So Emily, great question. Come down later Thank get you. this book <laughs> for you. And is Anne McElevain here? Anne? Hi, Anne. Run down here to this microphone and tell us who you are. Uh, hi. I'm Annie. Uh, I'm an environmental science major. I'm a senior. Um, and my question is, in this week's reading from civileats.com, the 2018 Farm Bill is described as permitting a family farm loophole, which would allow farms to balloon in size because children, their spouses, nephews, nieces, cousins, and other family members would be eligible for subsidies if they're involved in the family farm. And the reading described that revision as a way for big operations to get bigger, but I'm wondering if that's really the case. Um, are there enough family, mem family members that work on big farms for this revision to be as big of a deal as it was presented in the reading? Um, it seems to me that big corporate farms aren't generally run by extended families and therefore the loophole wouldn't be as damaging. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good, thoughtful question. Um, I, uh, I believe this article was written by my co-author, Dan Imhoff, um, uh, just a couple months ago. Um, this is something, 
I don't think we have really seen numbers yet. This is pr uh, one of several new changes in the Farm Bill that was just passed in December. Um, but as, as pointed out, there were uh, kind of an ex this expansion in who is deemed eligible for receiving uh, subsidies through the Farm Bill by kind of extending the definition of who's included in the family that works on a farm to receive benefits. Um, so the article pointed out that children and spouses are considered actively engaged just by the nature of being a child or a spouse, and so they're eligible. And then nieces, nephews, folks extended by a generation or by other households don't ever have to step a foot on the farm, might be able to answer a question, yes or no, and they're considered to play a role in the management process on that farm. Um, and so then they're eligible to receive subsidies. Um, and again, might, might not ever step foot on the farm, might not really play an active role. Um, and so without, I, I can't offer numbers at this point to be able to say, but um, this, it's, it's absolutely a problem in thinking about expanding the number of the, the farms, particularly the big farms, the top subsidy earning farms, like some of the figures I pointed out from Environmental Working Group who are already receiving the bulk of subsidies um, opens up that top tier population to get more and more subsidies and kind of skew even further in that direction. Um, some of these, quote, families, um, as Nina was pointing out, are actually, can actually be corporations, um, again, that have a huge amount of income already coming in, um, a huge amount of subsidies that are kind of comprising a lot of their income. So this just kind of allows that to escalate even further. Could it be used, if you flipped it around and thought, I'm, I'm going to be an entrepreneurial new farmer, a beginning farmer, would there be any opportunity there? Would it put a little wind at your back, possibly, if you were just starting up as a farmer, or wasn't really crafted for that approach? That's a good question. Um, I haven't, mm -hmm. I have not read the specific language in the bill, okay. so I'm not, I'm certain that was not the thinking behind uh, that change in the farm bill, but I don't know I can't speak to. Okay, well, Adrian, if you're watching this on YouTube, you have to work on that question. Mm -hmm. Here, Annie, here's a book for you. Thanks for asking that question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Who else has got a question here in the classroom? Please. Oh, we have some questions. We have some questions from the viewers at home tonight. So, Fiona, come up to the mic and, and play act. Okay, in this, in so this I'm Michael from the Delta. Michael um, from the Delta. Michael is wondering, how are we going to limit CAFOs, which are confined animal feeding operations, I believe, um, which almost everyone acknowledges as environmentally, physiologically, and morally problematic? And as a follow-up to that, how might we incentivize not just organic farming, but regenerative farming? Thank you, Michael. Two questions. He snuck in there, I see. Um, <laughs> Well, at least on the first one, I'll say, yes, capos are very, very concerning, and um, Chrissy's co-author, Dan Imhoff, has written a great book, horrifying book about capos. I think the problem is that we have to eliminate the support for them that's coming through the conservation title. So unfortunately, okay, so CAFOs have tremendous environmental impacts. Uh, USDA and lobbyists have fought very hard to keep the EPA away from CAFOs. They said, don't worry, EPA, we can handle this. That's a problem, that they're not subject to a lot of environmental regulations. But unfortunately, and this is an interesting thing for any of you pursuing policy careers in terms of unintended consequences, is that in the effort to fix the environmental problems of CAFOs, a huge amount of money dedicated for environmental conservation in the Farm Bill has gone to support CAFOs or to mitigate their bad effects. So, it, you know, de facto, they are subsidizing them. So, what do you really do in that situation? You have a bad business structure that is very polluting, but then there's money to reduce the pollution maybe a tiny bit. <laughs> so um, it, it's a Band-Aid solution, and we're going to have to fix it uh, if we want to um, crack down on CAFOs. Well, you talked about uh, concentration of power. Uh, oh. I think it was last year, but uh, Professor Reich was here, Robert Reich, who's one of our treasures here on the Berkeley campus in the School of Public Policy, and he gave a really compelling talk here at Edible Education. It's all available on the Edible Schoolyard Project website, but he showed 
how this concentration of power just keeps, you know, reinforcing this kind of incumbent uh, advantage in the system. And I think one of his key takeaways goes back to our power as eaters and in making decisions. And we always talk about things being potentially more expensive, but we have to, I think, put on the lenses. Those of us that are you know, on the path to becoming enlightened eaters, we have to really start to think about how we're spending our money in the true cost of things. So it may appear more expensive now. It's hard for, obviously, people that are you know, working with the SNAP program, but we do have some allocation of, you know, how we can decide on what we want to spend our money on. Mm -hmm. But so. I think we just have to eat less meat. There yeah. has to be less, less demand for meat. Yeah. We have to change our culture. Well, that's what the, yeah. the Lancet study really says, um, that, uh, I mean, and, and Dan Barber was here last year talking about the third plate, which is really moving meat not, not necessarily making everybody a vegetarian or a vegan, but just making the meat a condiment or a mm -hmm. seasoning or a right. flavor. And, exactly. and we have to move beyond this expectation of having this big piece of protein in the middle of the... Mm -hmm. I, I was invited to a conference this week, and I asked for a vegetarian meal, and I got a bowl of risotto that had no vegetables in it. It was really <laughs> ironic. How sad. Know. Yeah. yeah, but that's where mm -hmm. chefs are. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what a, a banquet chef at a, you know, what you'd call a nice hotel, that's what they think is a vegetarian meal. And that was in California. That was, in, yeah, that was about so imagine, 15 miles from here. Right, everywhere else in I the mean, country. I mean, the yeah. idea is that a vegetarian meal means it doesn't have meat in it, but it actually didn't have vegetables either. <laughs> <laughs> I think a better um, path is to question cheap meat. And that's question, a, question cheap meat. Question cheap That's meat. a more of a middle path. Some people will choose to be vegetarians, most will not, but we can all question cheap meat and that will lead us to capos and hopefully their elimination. One of our students last semester did her thesis on how meat, the whole meat industry, which is controlled by I think four big companies in the United States, mm -hmm. is all subsidized not only on the growing of the grain, the feeding of the uh, the cattle and the animals, but then it's also subsidized again because the largest purchasers of meat in the United States are the U.S. military mm -hmm. and the prison system. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from the Delta, Fiona? Uh, or? We have a question from... From Oakland, this is Jay. So he says, which political players have the most influence over the farm bill's contents, and do ordinary citizens really stand a chance against the big ag lobby? Yeah. Um, so I guess for the, the latter half of the question, at least, um, I could point out, since I just published a book that's called The Farm Bill, A Citizen's Guide, um, I, I am personally, and absolutely my co-author, are passionate about teaching all of you as both taxpayers and as eaters, uh, and hopefully, I guess, as advocates to be able to help move the food system forward. So we have, at the end of the book, a whole what we call toolkit with information about the government agencies, so I guess, for the most part, USDA, all the different offices and departments who play a role uh, in, in different aspects of the food and farming system in the US. We outline all the different committees in Congress so that you can understand maybe who, where your senator uh, or, or your congressman fall so you can uh, vote accordingly, you can speak up on behalf of legislation accordingly. Um, if any of you are ever interested in coming to DC, um, so many of the briefings and um, testimonies on the Hill are open to the public. I just delivered a briefing about this a couple weeks ago, so do let me know if you're ever in town and you want to come sit down on something on the Hill. Um, and so you can absolutely uh, play a role in speaking up to your congressperson. Um, I think, uh, as I just mentioned, when I delivered this briefing, I was also excited to be a um, kind of a representative to a lot of staffers on the Hill to educate them about the Farm Bill. Um, I have 
been studying very intensively the Farm Bill now for the last several years to work on this book. And I, I've worked in the EPA for two years. I'm a dietitian. I know a lot about health and food. And so through my education and my work, I was really excited to be able to speak to the, the um, staff working on the Hill uh, to then be able to share information with their Congress people, um, acknowledging that at this point, I've been able to learn so much about this and I'm imparting the knowledge about what are the problems with the current food system and what can they all do over the next year when funds are appropriated in the Farm Bill and before the next Farm Bill is passed in, in the next five years. So you all in the room, absolutely, you're all going to go on to become experts in your respective fields. If And for many of you, that'll be in the food system. So um, you can write books, you can write articles, you can go on the Hill and testify, um, and you can impart some of your, some of your knowledge. Um, so that's a, definitely another important role that we all have as citizens as well. We're proud of our Berkeley graduates. Mm, Thank definitely. you for doing that. <laughs> and to answer the other part of the person's question, it's such a great question. Uh, the, the most influential people in Congress are the heads of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees and also the heads of the Agricultural Subcommittees and Appropriations who decide exactly how much money they're going to get. So the Ag Committees write the legislation. This is as much money as we hope to spend. And then the appropriators say, OK, here's much, how much you actually can spend. So as I mentioned, we have a bunch of Californians on there. Um, if you're from other states, you could see, just look online and see who of your representatives, if they are in either of the ag committees. If they are, they are the ones writing it. Um, and then our, for instance, well, Senator Feinstein is on the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, so she helps hold the purse strings. So, um, and you can call and request a meeting with any of these folks any old time. If you're a constituent, you have a higher likelihood of getting in with them, but even if they're, you're not, you can try your best. And absolutely, I mean, we all have a chance to have a say in it. Just want to echo what you said. And, um, you know, we're, you're, you're way too young to give up now. So please um, um, spend as much of your life um, keeping uh, policymakers accountable, because otherwise you're just really writing them a blank check, and they love that. So bang on their door and, and um, give them respectful feedback, um, because they work for you. It sounds like you need to have a field trip for your class to Washington. The yeah. Farm Bill class. Let's do that. That sounds great. So, Shanti, you were talking about the largest group of people in, in who are employed in California. That 500,000. Many of them work in the food industry. Actually, yeah, many of those were cooks. Yeah, mm -hmm. and cooks and and probably servers and right. people that right. work in food service. So, next week, just building on that, we have a very distinguished guest. Danny Meyer, who is the CEO and um, head of the Union Square Hospitality Group and really one of the champions of the uh, no tipping mm -hmm. movement. And he partners with Saru Jayaraman, who's also a professor here on campus. He'll be here. He's flying in from New York just to come be with us next week. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to having him here. And he's going to talk all about this um, tipping issue and hit topic of his talk is, you know, are, are food service and hospitality jobs sustainable and, and how can we make them so? So I want to um, have a big round of applause for our guests tonight. And we'll see you next week, same time, same place for Edible Ed 101. <laughs>